Hi, it's Mitch from PFS Network, and today I'm going to be speaking to you about something which has not been covered well, that drug manufacturer Merck has been aware that their drug finasteride can cause persistent adverse effects in some men that continue even after stopping the drug since their clinical trials performed all the way back in the 1990s. So firstly, if you're new to our channel, please check out our other content, particularly our What is PFS Explainer video if you're brand new to the issue. But today we'll be talking about the 2019 investigation by media giant Reuters into Merck's clinical trials for finasteride in the 1990s that discovered internal company documents, memos and emails that showed Merck knew about adverse effects that could persist even after discontinuation of the drug and have deliberately misled consumers, healthcare practitioners and the general public for over 20 years. So I want to start by talking about why this video is important and it's important for several reasons. So firstly, this investigation, this story is not well known to consumers of the drug or to the general public. So there's a total of three videos on YouTube about the investigation and they have a total of 10,000 total views. Uh, and if I was a consumer looking for information on Google search about potential side effects of finasteride, the Reuters story, the investigation, none of this information uh, even comes up in the search results. Secondly, it's important for potential consumers of the drug to know about this information so they can make a more informed decision about the potential safety risks. And finally, many clinicians or asymptomatic users of the drug often dismiss the existence of persistent adverse effects or post finasteride syndrome by pointing to the clinical trials as proof that on-drug side effects are rare and that there is no evidence of persistent adverse effects that continue after stopping the drug. And as we'll discover, as we've already discussed, the clinical trials show exactly the opposite of that, that there has been evidence of persistent adverse effects that can continue after stopping the drug as far back as the late 1990s. So the key findings from these documents and from the Reuters investigation, they show a number of things. Now, firstly, and most importantly, in a five-year study that involved 323 men, at least one man experienced persistent sexual dysfunction after discontinuing the drug. That's according to an email sent by Patrick Ruane, a medical program coordinator who coordinated the trials for Propecia to Dr. Keith Kaufman, the clinical head of Propecia who oversaw the trials. Now, if you dig even further into the documents, you'll find a deposition with Dr. Kaufman where you'll find that this man was still experiencing persistent sexual dysfunction six months after the trial finished and after he stopped the medication. Ruane also tells Kaufman in that same email that during years three to five of the study, 23 patients experienced drug-related sexual adverse events. Now, Ruane tells Kaufman that 16 of those patients had adverse events resolve, but that the adverse events remained for seven men even after they discontinued the study. Now, in his deposition, Kaufman then says that Merck had no way of knowing when or if those adverse events resolved for those seven patients. So that's two very important pieces of information about the drug safety risks. And what did Merck do with that information? Well, they made a small but very significant change to the warning label for Propecia in 2002. They changed the warning label from saying resolution occurred in all men who discontinued Propecia to resolution occurred in men who discontinued Propecia, meaning it did not resolve in all men. This is really important as they've removed the explicit mention of all men without communicating the reason why to consumers. And that warning label remains the same today, even after the Reuters investigation. So next, the revised warning label omits nearly all of the experiences of those 23 patients that I just mentioned, and only reports on the experiences of patients who took the drug in the first year of research, and those who took it continuously for all five years. So they did not include the experiences of men who dropped out 
uh, before the five years had finished, including those who dropped out in the final three years of research due to sexual side effects. Next, according to a deposition from former VP of marketing at Merck, Paul Howes, before the launch of Propecia, Merck had several patents expiring in the late 1990s to early 2000s that put at least half of its US revenue from four key drugs at risk. He also acknowledged that Propecia had the potential to be a blockbuster drug, meaning it would earn at least $500 million in annual revenue. In his deposition, Howes also discusses 1998 market research that showed of the men they surveyed, at least 40% of them were aware of potential on-drug sexual side effects, and that at least 20% of those men would not take the drug as a result. Howes also says at the time that there was no information or knowledge in the general public about the potential for persistent adverse effects. And that's really important to note. At this point, we're just talking about on-drug effects. Howes acknowledges that if the potential for persistent dysfunction was known, it would have a drastic and negative impact on sales. So what does all of this mean then? Well, firstly, it shows that multiple high-ranking Merck executives that oversaw the trials of the drug have accepted that there was at least one man and potentially as many as seven men who ex experienced persistent adverse effects upon discontinuation of the drug for at least six months afterwards during their clinical trials. Now that's uh, at best 0.3% of men or at worst 2.1% of men who experienced this persistent dysfunction after stopping the drug. And as we know from the Paul Howes deposition, there was no public knowledge about the possibility for persistent adverse effects at the time of the five-year trials. So the experiences of this one man and potentially as many as seven men, they cannot be dismissed as a potential nocebo effect as a result of prior knowledge about persistent adverse effects. The only time a Merck executive questions the validity of this man's experiences is Paul Howes during his deposition, uh, where he says it's possible that the man and others already had sexual dysfunction before the trial. Now, that's a fair point. But immediately, the plaintiff's lawyer addresses this by telling Mr. Howes that Merck precluded anyone from the trial with prior sexual dysfunction. Now, as we know from uh, this litigation and numerous other public mentions, Merck has since sought to blame persistent dysfunction being reported by men on numerous other factors, such as their baldness, um, prior depressive history, even smoking. And we know that clinicians have sought to mischaracterize uh, post-finasteride syndrome as a delusional disorder um, caused by stimulated reporting, we know that cannot be the case here because such reporting didn't exist. Next, these findings show that the warning label for finasteride is entirely inaccurate and misleading, and nothing has changed even after this report. Just quickly for context, on the warning label for finasteride, it still says that the incidence of side effects decreases to 0.3% by the fifth year of treatment. The clinical head of Propecia, Dr. Kaufman, himself says in an internal memo that the 0.3% figure is totally misleading because by the fifth year, you have weeded out all the dropouts with the sexual adverse experiences. There is no mention of the possibility for persistent side effects on the warning label, only the subtle mention of side effects resolving in men. The current warning label says the chances of on-drug side effects are 3.8%. If you consider that 29 of the 323 men involved in the five-year study experienced side effects, that's 8.9%, not 3.8%. I will concede, however, that the warning label does include some limited information about post-marketing experiences. And that ties into my next point, which is that it's impossible to tell from the numbers that Merck has published exactly what percentage of men experience sexual dysfunction during the full five years of their trial. Now, it's really important to note here that the way Merck has reported their data to the FDA and publicly is not considered fair practice or standard practice, and that's according to Harvard Medical School professor, Dr. Jerry Avorn. 
It's also important to note that physicians having access to accurate safety data is really important, as Nelson Novick, a dermatology professor at Mount Sinai notes, so that patients can make informed decision-making about the drug that they're taking. And finally, it also shows that it's pretty obvious and has already been called out in several studies that there was inadequate safety reporting in Merck's clinical trials for finasteride for hair loss. And despite all of this, there is still fierce resistance from drug manufacturers like Merck, other hair loss companies, dermatologists, and users of the drug to the existence of post-finasteride syndrome or potential persistent adverse effects, or that the condition is a delusional disorder caused by stimulated reporting about finasteride. We hope that this video will add to the information available to potential consumers, clinicians, and the general public about the safety of finasteride.